I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, The Martian with Matt Damon, where he basically mm. stuck on Mars, and he says he's got to science the sh out of it to, to survive. I kind of feel like that in terms of longevity. I've got to science as much of this as I can. Exercise is clearly good for health span and increasing average survival, but there's almost some something simultaneously bad about it where you don't get to the maximal or beyond. Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and today our guest is Dr. Michael Lustgarden. Michael is a PhD in physiology who specializes in nutrition, exercise physiology, and longevity. Michael has an amazing YouTube channel called Conquer Aging or Die Trying. He's tracked his biomarkers regularly over the last 15 years and has gained a lot of insights into what actually matters when it comes to slowing down aging and promoting longevity. Dr. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, Seam. How you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. And I'm really excited to talk with you because, you know, you have like an amazing YouTube channel where you've uh, documented all these different like experiments you've done on yourself and all the studies as well, correlating with, you know, biological age and actual chronological age and mortality risk and all those things. So it's yeah, like a really good database and a resource for just people to check out. Okay. Like what is the things that actually matter in terms of mortality risk when we're talking about, you know, different biomarkers or dietary practices and, and all those things and uh, like you know there's very few people who have you know like you say in a lot of the video videos that you've tracked all your food for the last you know six years or so uh, or more and uh, all the bio, bio biomarkers as well for like 15 years so it's, yeah like really uh, glad to talk with you and uh, share some insight to people yeah thanks team so uh, just real quick uh when I was growing up, I started off with the bodybuilder magazines and I'm still obviously into fitness, uh, you know, but that's another story. That's a tangent. But back then, Jack Lane was a big iconic fitness, fitness figure. And he would always say things like eat real food and exercise. So for the longest time, that was the motto. Right. But then I thought there's got to be a higher level. What is the higher level to this? And that involves, you know, objective biomarkers, right? Like mm. blood biomarkers, things like blood pressure, um, as many objective objectively measured biomarkers as possible. So if we track that over time with the goal of slowing down age-related changes and, and uh, you know, what does that recipe look like in terms of how much exercise, what's an optimal body weight, uh, what macros and micros. So yeah, that's that's been the journey. Uh, mm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm glad to see a lot more focus on that when we're talking about, you know, longevity and uh, aging, because, you know, when I grew up, you know, <laughs> which is like, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, that when I was, you know, first exposed to content online about fitness or health and stuff, then, you know, there wasn't back then, there wasn't like a lot of scientific or people didn't back up their claims a lot with science and data and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, that's what matters the most. Like, you know, you can have, you know, let's say, for example, even like the mouse studies or something, you have some results in a mouse study, but in humans, it might be completely different. Uh, or like some people say that, hey, this diet is the best, but actually their blood work is worse than uh, what we know is optimal, then, uh, you know, that that means a lot, the actual like data and the actual, you know, outcome. And I think, unfortunately, so many people are using animal studies and even RCTs done in other people, you know, uh, and then saying, oh, it worked in those studies. I'm going to take it for myself. But then that, you know, that's great. That's better than doing nothing. But then, like you said, objective biomarkers. Does it even work for you? Is it even improving your net sum of biomarkers? And I think too, a, a limitation there is a lot of people are focused on metabolic health. So glucose and lipids, and then mm -hmm. they forget about everything else. And I don't want to put any, you know, uh, anybody on blast, but I see that a lot. And the fact is they forget, forget about kidney health, liver health, and, you know, immune cells. Maybe they focus on inflammation, but the fact is maybe you won't die from adverse metabolic health. Granted, that's an important thing to focus on, but every organ system is going to decline during aging and, and neglecting one or many, I think is a you know fallacious approach. So I try to cover them all. Uh, granted, that said, I have deficiencies in that approach. I haven't tried to regrow hair and slow that down, but that's not going to kill me. Uh, right. and you know, maybe my skin health, I could f spend more time on that, but you know, it's, it, it's, it becomes, a, it can become a full-time job, uh, which I just don't yet have that time for, you know, so yeah. yet, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. There's a lot of things that uh, go wrong, but you know, the biggest thing is just staying alive, <laughs> like I said, uh, yeah. before we started recording, but, uh, 
yeah so how did you like wh- wh- when did it begin and uh, what was like what's the journey like what was the first thing you started with and you know you can maybe how to, where are we not right now where are you right now with your journey and your progress and what your results so far yeah so uh in terms of tracking blood biomarkers that's been going on for 2008 2007 once a year just general checkup i'd record all of my data in an excel file and you know I, i've heard you say oh, i test once a year but to be totally honest it's it's not enough right because is mm-hmm. it well is it enough if it is enough if that one test per year is representative of the whole year and from my experience that's not generally true because for example in the summer i suffer from seasonal allergies and it hits me so hard i get an immune activation which is quantifiable with fitness metrics that look like I'm infected with COVID, which is ridiculous. It's just grass and pollen. So if I only measured all of the other times of the year and never saw that data in the in the summer months, I would think that my health is fantastic, you know, or vice versa. If I only measured in the June months or June, July and never measured anywhere else, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't know, right? So I think having regular repeated measurements, uh, I've test tested seven times per year last year. Uh, I'm on pace for the same amount this year. I work with people who do it 12 times a year, which I'm not ready for that yet. But all right, so that said, I started off doing once a year. And then 2008 till about 2015, that's what I was doing. Even sometimes I skipped a year, which wasn't great. But then 2015, for whatever reason, I had the idea, I need to kick this up. I need to really get this into hyperdrive. This isn't enough. I'm not being scientific about it. So I started tracking my diet every day, weighing literally everything. And um, I don't generally eat out much. So it was pretty easy to do that back then. And I still don't generally eat out much. So still easy to do that now. But I started recording everything in terms of diet. And so if I blood test on day one and I blood test on day 60, now I have an average dietary intake over those 59 days. So I take the average dietary intake for that period which now lines up with that blood test. So each blood test now has an average dietary intake. So with each sub- subsequent blood test, I have data that can be correlated. So once I got past four, five, six blood tests, uh, I started looking at correlations in my diet. Now, I mean everything. Um, actually, it started off with just macros and micros. And then sometime in 2018, I thought, this isn't representative either. I need to start tracking food intake because I'm assuming that everything in food can be reduced down to you know uh, macros and micros which may not be true so uh eventually i started tracking all of that and looking at correlations and um in trying different things in that approach you know going to a higher fat you know 115 grams per day which is high for me going to a lower fat 65 grams higher protein 150 grams lower protein 60 grams having a range of that data uh since 2015 and following the correlations and not just following one correlation it's you know, I've got um, biomarkers of kidney and liver and immune cells, as many as the standard, um, you know, biomarkers on a chem pa- panel here in the U.S. as possible. It's about 25 biomarkers, nothing crazy yet back then, or nothing too extreme. So, um, for example, if I have a protein intake, how does that correlate with all 25 biomarkers? So if I've got, then the next step in that is knowing how the biomarkers change during aging and all cause mortality risk because the reference range is not intended for longevity. It's just a population based average. Are you inside that 95% phase confidence interval? Are you too low or are you too high? Then they get, you know, medicine gets involved. So knowing how each biomarker changes during aging, do I want it to be high? Do I want it to be low? Uh, I can push, not push, or I can follow the correlations. For example, pr- high protein is associated with high glucose going in the wrong direction. High proteins associated with lower homocysteine going in the right direction. So when I, and, and using a statistical significance threshold, just a standard P equals uh, P less than 0.05, which is pretty standard in, in academic studies, how many are less than that threshold in terms of going in the right direction versus wrong and then having a net score. So for example, for each macro, micro and foods, I have a net score now and I try to literally follow all of the correlations for the next test. And then if the next test, with the next test, it's like a, you know, it's like a neural net where I'm recalculating after every test. And after doing that for a long time, I've been able to further reduce my quote unquote biological age using uh, Levine's test, which was pretty good for a while. It was about 12 years younger than my uh, chronological. And then sometime about last year, I figured out the recipe basically and in my data. 
and was able to push that even further down to 16, 17 years and consistently six, 16 to 17 years, you know, on a full seven year test average. So it isn't following one correlation with diet and the biomarkers. It's, you know, if I have 40 correlations, you know, am I following 38 of them, 37 of them? Because it's very difficult to follow them all. But I try to, you know, uh, push my diet to follow the biomarkers. Now, in working with people uh, who are also trying to do this, does the does this uh, approach work in other people? For the people that do the same thing, that follow as many of their own correlations that are doing, you know, tracking their diet and tracking the blood test variables, they also have been able to reduce their Levine test age. Uh, but for others that are about 50-50, you know, maybe they follow half the correlations and the other half, they're just not as diligent, you know, s s uh, more stable, not making further reductions. So um, that's where I am there. And then uh, in the last couple of years, I decided to expand from Levine's test and even using aging.ai, which are pretty easy to use, free uh, uh, blood-based biomarker tests, going into the epigenetics. Uh, Dunedin Pace, Horvath, and then I've even expanded it there into telomere length, uh, metabolomics, um, or microbiome health. All these things can be tracked and optimized so that we can, you know, minimize disease risk and potentially maximize longevity. Mm. Yeah, like you know, longevity is, or you know, we never know when we're gonna die. Like there's some genetic factors that determine that, and um, you know, un unpredictable events or whatever as well. But uh, at least like, you know, the best thing you can do is to try to, you know, optimize your blood work, because that is a reflection of your biological age, like all the different markers reflect your biological age. And, um, you know, there's probably not a single one, maybe that some of them are better than others, obviously. But uh, you have to like, try to optimize all the biomarkers to give yourself the highest chance of living the longest, if that makes sense. Hundred percent. I was the first thought that came to my mind was brother from another mother because I I agree a hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, in terms of no one knows when we'll die, you know the fact is something's going to kill us, right? Potentially, or we live long enough to live forever, whether that's true or not. But uh, you know, if you've optimized, like you said, everything, we minimize that risk, and then you know you improve your chances. Like if I get a bad infection, if I've been working on optimizing lymphocytes and keeping inflammation generally low, I should be able to res respond relatively quickly versus someone who maybe they don't track their lymphocytes. They're already starting off if they get a bad infection uh, you know, with low lymphocytes and the in infection drives it even further down, further increasing the risk of death. So for me, I can't think of a better strategy to you know, minimize disease risk, minimize uh, even the duration of a potential uh, disease, you know, um, well, maybe infection wise. Uh, mm. And But then the drawback is I hear from people, they'll say, well, where's the proof that this works? There is no proof. How would you prove it? So um, the, the proof is we'll have to see, you know, with people who are using this approach, how long do we live? Right. Uh, and then take the average of that relative to the average population. So it's, you know, it's a N of one RCT. Uh, hmm. non-academic without having to, you know, rely on academia to take 50 years to figure it out or not. So, hmm. yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the, there's no really other way to go about it. So let's say as medicine becomes more advanced, let's say mainstream medicine and uh, doctors and uh, what they will try to do as well is to just follow the similar pattern of like future medicine is going to be about optimizing all the bi biomarkers with different methods like diets exercise supplements different therapeutics and interventions like like that's going to be just the future we're, we're just you know doing it <laughs> n equals one right now and in the future like there's no other way to really extend human lifespan or at least like health span other than trying to optimize all the biomarkers one at a time and with different methodologies to do that so i agree I agree 100% there. The only question is when in the future? Will it be 20 mm. years? Will it be 40 years? And just just a quick story on that. So before before I went to grad school, which sounds horribly you know uh, pretentious, but I'm not not trying to be. Nutrigenomics, the quote unquote nutrigenomics, was a hot field 20 years ago. Uh, so I thought, yeah, that sounds great. I want to know what's the best diet to influence gene expression. Well, here we are, 20 plus years later, and what's a diet based on your genes, you know, and I don't mean like four genes. I mean, the full human genome sequencing and based on your individual genome, what's the best? No, nobody knows. Right. So it's 20 years later. And even in terms of quote unquote precision, precision nutrition, 
that's even a slowly evolving field. You know, it started with like uh, CGMs and some research labs, for example, have done the uh, white bread challenge where some people will have a glucose spike in response to eating white bread and others won't. So then you can personalize who may be, you know, glucose responders or non-responders to certain foods, but still that's one biomarker, right? What's the net effect systemically? There is no net effect systemically approach. It's still only optimizing glucose or only... Op so that gets to the question of when will it happen? Will it take 20 years, 40 years? Who, it will be in the future for sure. But mm. I don't want to wait around, you know, for, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's you. It's too late by that time if you just wait. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. with aging, it is like you're always, you know, the trend with aging is that everything goes down, the decline, the muscle mass, muscle strength, year to max, uh, sex hormones and all those things, they decrease with age. And uh, if you're just doing nothing, then uh, you're kind of slippering down. Some people naturally will age slower because of genetics or their environment, whereas others, you know, will have to put in more effort to do to achieve a slower speed of aging or to slow down the decline. But, you know, if you're doing nothing, then you're always going to be uh, aging faster compared to actually doing all the kind of fundamentals, at least that we know are beneficial for slowing down kind of the decline. Yeah, and I don't have longevity uh, longevity genetics either. I mean, I saw your story and your family history. You know, the longest lived person in my family too is currently my dad at 80. But before him, the longest lived man was 67. And that was kind of the upper limit. Anyone who got to 67 was dead. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've said this before, but I don't know if you've seen the movie, uh, The Martian with Matt Damon, where he basically mm -hmm. stuck on Mars and he says he's got to science the sh out of it to, to survive. I kind of feel like that in terms of longevity, you know, uh, I've got to science as much of this as I can using science as a verb. Uh, it's, you know, I, I don't want to sound like an immortal, Im immortalist, uh, you know, because that starts to venture off into fringe, but I don't like the idea of death. I don't want to ever want to die. I legitimately want to live long enough to live forever. And if I can't, well, uh, you know, I've said it before, but I'll die trying. Right. So, um, there's yeah. too much cool stuff to do you know there's too much cool stuff to do and i don't want to be dead so i can't do it so <laughs> yeah and i mean like the quality of life itself will be higher yeah. anyway like if uh the average person starts to like take different medications and uh not be able to be or not be able to do things independently really uh, to like you know house chores or even walking or eating then, uh, you know, what kind of life is that? <laughs> so, you know, if you can extend the health span, which means that you stay, you know, more active and more freed, you have more freedom to do what you want for longer, even if you don't live longer, it's kind of worth it to the quality of life that uh, you experience. 100%, 100% agree. And that gets me into thinking about specific mechanisms that are, you know, deficient or downregulated during aging that can be targeted, you know, mm. whether diet or supplements uh that yeah which gets back to the what's the best thing to target what's your actual data what's your actual deficiency or suboptimal status and can you target that directly through diet supplements exercise you know all that mm. so maybe we can cover some of like most fundamentals but uh with a like what's your research what, what have you found with your research so like you know exercise diet and yeah like exercise and diet are probably like the two, two biggest ones that people know argued for health and longevity so like what is what 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 have you found that is the biggest you know things that uh improve the speed of aging um and uh, what what are like the most associated with reduced mortality yeah so there's a few answers in there because underlying diet and fitness is sleep because if my mm. sleep is even within 1 hour of my average less uh, cognitively and physically, I, I, I'm not at my best and I can be easily overtrained if I'm even in a mild sleep debt. So the essential is sleep, optimizing that, at least for me, uh, but then probably calorie restriction. I mean, I've heard you say it, uh, that plenty of, you know, gold standard research on that, um, in my data too, um, you know, cause I have, ca I have calorie data lined up with the blood test biomarkers and, um, it's, the lower my calorie intake, the lower my average calorie intake for each blood test, that's associated with the best benefit. And actually, I've reduced my Dunedin pace from a high of 0.89 to 0.76 on the test in, in May. I have, I'm waiting on July test results. Nice. The only thing that's different over that time is that I've been slowly reducing my body fat levels um, and the diet has been mostly the same. So 
probably calorie restriction. Now, for most people, that's very difficult. For me, it is too. In the past, I've lost 20 pounds in six weeks and then binged it back on. So over the past uh, two to three years, I've been just making very small cuts, you know, maybe 30 calories per day on average. So, you know, for blood test one, 2,200, blood test two, 2,170, average per day over a very long period of time. And I've found that that's, uh, you know, I'm probably about 20% CR based on that when compared with where I was uh, three years ago. So, um, but that's what works for me. If some people want to cut calories fast and that's what works for them, have at it. But I'm in, interested in very long-term changes. I've changed my my exercise routine. Wait, from... let me, I want to ask him questions yeah. about the calorie restriction. So like, you know, yeah, like people usually say that. So how do you like, yeah, like quantify or define it? Uh, people find it difficult to like either know how many calories they need to eat or like because you know if you <laughs> go by the premise that calorie restriction will slow down aging then you know eventually you'll eat nothing or zero calories like <laughs> but where do you draw the line of okay this is the amount of calories that I'm going to eat and this is the amount of weight I'm going to lose so yeah like what's the like sweet spot for the weight loss how, how much weight do you need to lose and how many calories do like people need to eat for both kind of uh -huh. genders if you know yeah. So I see two or three things going on there. Uh, one is um, for me, my highest average calorie intake that corresponded to any blood test was about 2,800. So for now, my average calorie intake is somewhere around 2,100. Mm. So just doing that math, it's somewhere around 20 to 25% CR. Now at 2,800 calories per day, I was more active, purposely more active. So I don't, if, even if you don't use that as my set point, quote unquote, 2,800, 2,500 or so versus 2,100, that's uh uh, you know, it's still a CR now, out, you know, just blatant CR for the po point of doing CR. There is some animal data that it may not work for all uh, genetic backgrounds. So with that in mind, also following the blood biomarkers and other objective uh, biomarkers of health and systemic function, right? So, um, you know, as I mentioned, for me, when tracking calorie intake versus about 25 different biomarkers, a lower calorie intake is associated with an overall more quote unquote beneficial biomarker profile. So, um, so that's two. And then, um, three is okay. If you keep eating lower and lower and lower, eventually get to zero and then you're just, you know, frail and decrepit, but that's exactly the thing. You know, there's going to be a lower level where you're at your leanest. If you go lower, you're losing muscle mass, you're losing muscle strength, fitness, function, mobility, all of that stuff. You don't want to be clearly below that, but mm. uh, is that 6% body fat for men, for men, for example? I mean, I can't say what it would be for women uh, because now you've got, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, pre not pregnancy, but uh, period, you know, you, you lose your period if you go below a uh, certain, you, you know, you stop, you stop ovulating, right? So I, you don't want to clearly go, go below that if you're a woman, but, um, or maybe they do if, if they're not just interested in ovulating, but um you know, so there's, I can't say what the optimal body fat would be just broadly. It would probably vary between people, but, uh, I'd say most people have room for improvement in terms of reducing their body fat down to yeah. get to, you know, um, and I've been, you know, and there, I may, there, there may become a point where I just literally get too lean and the biomarkers start to look worse, but because I've been tracking the biomarkers for so long and they're generally very stable, uh, I, you know, I, I, when I test, it's very reproducible because I know the diet. I standardize, you know, when the last workout is before each blood test. I standardize the fasting period before each blood test, what mm -hmm. time the blood test is, how much water I'm taking in. So all, many variables that can impact the blood test results. If the blood tests are different, it's more likely that, that it's stuff that I've done in my approach rather than ex other external variables. So my data is pretty consistent. So if I see some wild change or a, even a slow moving change over a few tests, I can track it back. All right. Is it my calorie intake is too low or, uh, is it my, I'm just too lean. I'm losing a little bit of mass and strength. So, um, yeah, objective markers to find that sweet spot. Mm. So it's more like a J shaped curve that if you're too low body fat and eating too little calories, then that may, might increase your mortality because of like undernutrition and, um, uh, like losing muscle mass and muscle strength. And if you're kind of reducing your calories then to, to some sort of a sweet spot, then that's the lowest mortality. But if you overeat calories and you gain weight, then that also increases mortality because of the you know issues with obesity and weight gain. So it's, yeah, like everyone kind of has to find obviously their kind of sweet spot. Uh, but yeah, I agree that many people 
you know, <laughs> you know, the average person isn't really that lean, or or, or they, if they do think that they're lean, then they probably have at least a few pounds extra that they could lose uh, to for like optimal health. Like whether or not it's worthwhile the effort for them, obviously, is everyone else to decide. You know, it's you know, it it does require effort to eat less and then to be like slightly hungry. And like you know, I've been I've been doing different kinds of you know. I've been doing like bodybuilding as well when I was young and and I always like try to maintain a lean body composition and yeah it does require like some deliberate effort to stay lean all the time and of course there are some methods to make it easier like time restricted eating or or you know even like different kinds of dietary practices that you can use to improve satiety for example but yeah like it's it's you know it's not easy to always stay uh, lean but of course you know it's some methods are easier than others yeah, I, I've had the same experience. Uh, but for me, uh, a high volume diet, so an mm. abundance of uh, you know vegetables and fruit. Uh, my average fiber intake is eighty, about eighty five grams per day on you know twenty one hundred mm. calories. So that's a very uh, you know high volume. So when I was eating lower volume, very difficult to be uh, satisfied and satiated. Um, for the first time, I, I can say, or you know, for at least the la last few years. Uh, eating a high volume approach works for me in terms of, uh, or helps me be more satiated where I'm not overeating. That's probably the most toxic thing um, that, and uh, it, well, in terms of health is just overeating. And even just a few hundred calories above your maintenance, you know, doing that for a few weeks will start to mess up all kinds of biomarkers, including uh, heart rate variability, resting heart rate. Um, so, but going back to that too, I've, um, I changed my exercise routine completely too. So I used to be just three hour workouts, throwing heavy weights around. I, I'm, you know, I've said this before, but I'm like a gorilla mindset. I just love lifting heavy stuff for a long time. It makes me feel good. But once I started tracking the fitness metrics, um, they were terrible. It, they were, weren't what you'd expect to see from someone, you know, walking 15 to 20 miles a week and doing two, two workouts a week, six hours of weightlifting. I was overtrained, chronically overtrained, tired all the time. Um, sleep quality was terrible. So once I started tracking heart rate variability, resting heart rate, I started to figure out, all right, what's my optimal training amount in terms of, uh, you know, duration of the workouts. And I, I, it was an ego, ego hit. I had to cut down the amount of sets and reps and volume of training. Um, and I, you know, it, I, people push back at me and say, well, what's your VO2 max? And I'll say, that's a, that's a fallacious argument because it's like saying, you know, I need to have a VO2 max of 70 or 65, an elite endurance athlete to live as long as possible. But there's no ev evidence that that's true. The VO2 max studies in terms of reduced all-cause mortality risk is in the low 50s. So even just a general fitness routine, you'll be in at least the low 40s. And I know that because I tested my VO2 max three times from 2010 to 2015. And there was no, I wasn't doing any hardcore cardio hit or, or like that. So now is low 40s, as good as low 50s, it's still a reduced all-cause mortality as compared to someone in the 20s or 30s at sedentary. Now, what if I'm maintaining the 40s for indefinitely versus someone who's probably going to have a hard, harder time maintaining that elite 50 plus VO2 max, you know? So, uh, and I was saying it's a fallacious argument because do I need to have a squat 1RM of 300 pounds or a 300, 250 pound bench press to live as physically uh, long as I can? I don't think so. I think, you mm. know, there's there's the risk of diminishing returns where the amount of training involved into getting there. And I say this is, you know, in the past, my one RM for the bench was 255 at 155 pounds body weight, but I can't physically train like that anymore. It's just, uh, I'm overtraining. So mm. is the longevity benefit of being at the elite of physical fitness? Um, is that, is there a long, is there an additive longevity benefit? I don't think so. Where are the, you know, the elite endurance athletes or, you know, uh, strength focused athletes at 115 years old, they don't exist. So there's gotta be some, which is crazy. There's gotta be some, uh, you know, exercise is clearly good for health span and increasing average survival, increasing average lifespan, but there's almost some, something simultaneously bad about it where you don't get to the maximal or beyond, you know, when I started, I mean, I, I, long winded rant, but when I started on this journey, journey and I saw all the bodybuilders as a teenager and reading the magazines, which nobody reads magazines anymore, but back when I was a kid, there were magazines. I was like, yeah, I want to be fit and ripped and lean like that too. And I thought, how can they die? They, they look fantastic. They're, they're, they're functional and fit and strong. And then I realized that's just, you know, I, I've seen your, your videos on it too, where uh, 
more muscle mass is not better, right? So, mm. but then it begs the question of why would that be true, right? So, uh, I think most people are chronically overtrained. Even most fitness minded people are chronically overtrained in the short term. And when I say short term, I mean in terms of average longevity, that's okay. But that chronic overtraining is clearly not good for the maximum. And mm. titrating the exercise dose, even in terms of how much muscle mass to carry, I think that's an important part of the maximum longevity uh, 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 equation. Mm. Whether that's true, we'll see. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, the amount, like you said, the amount of time it requires to reach this elite, especially VO2 max. It's, I don't know, specific numbers, but especially the older you get, then it's going to be ha very hard to maintain the 70 VO2 max. And even, even then, like the 70 may not need, may not be better <laughs> because the, the lowest reduction is already in the fifties. Uh, like yeah. you said that, uh, yeah, like, you know, the elite athletes, they obviously have to sacrifice part of their health and overtrain too much to reach the elite level. Uh, like I think there's very few cases, maybe like very individual cases where like some genetically very blessed people who um, are able to get to the elite level with much less training, um, then they might 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 get away with it. But the average person probably, you know, for them to get to the elite level, they have to sacrifice their health in 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 some amounts. And again, like the kind of moderate amounts of exercise is still the best. You you obviously still want to strive for getting like above average with uh, the uh, VO2 max and muscle strength and muscle mass, perhaps, but uh, like, you know, elite levels are probably like uh, too much. Yeah, 100% agree. But then it just raises the question of how much uh, individualized exercise is optimal, right? Mm. Uh, and that's very debatable. You'd have to study it, study yourself too, just like the biomarkers in the diet over a long period of time using objective metrics. Uh, so for me, for example, I, you know, uh, I'm on basically like a four day cycle at the most. Day one workout, day four workout, light, very light stuff in between. If if I go beyond that, if I start to work out the next workout on the fifth day or beyond, it's harder to maintain strength over time. And I don't want to see any strength decrement. Well, that's just one aspect of the approach, clearly, but just using that as an example. So if I start to have once every five days, strength starts to go down. Um, so, it, you know, but other people may be able to do, you know, every day and not, like you said, gen have a genetic background where they can tolerate, um, tolerate it physiologically and make strength gains and keep strength gains over. I, I can't physically do that. So um, mm. I wish that were true. I have a gorilla mindset to do that, but unfortunately my body doesn't agree. And whether that was true in the past, I don't know. I didn't track these things, you know, at, at your, in, in the twenties, like you I wish I did. Uh, so mm. What what do we, what do you look out for then? Like if uh, you're pushing it too much, like what metrics or so so I track heart rate variability and resting heart rate. And uh, when I'm quote unquote overtrained, the resting heart rate goes up and heart rate variability goes down. When it's fully recovered, heart rate variability is high, resting heart rate is low. So I basically give myself enough time before the next workout for them to more fully recover. So for example, before the last workout, just throwing out numbers, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, it was like. 70 42. So for the next three days, my heart rate variability was lower, 62 heart resting heart rate was higher, 42, uh, 43, 44, which suggested that I'm not ready for the next workout. But then when I woke up yesterday, that was actually up to 77 42. So now the data, now the data suggests that at least my cardiovascular system, but those cardiovascular system metrics are have inputs from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and also adrenal function. So it's like the integration of three different systems. But since my data was quote unquote back to its peak, that suggests I'm ready for a workout. So I, you know, quote unquote hit it hard or I did my usual workout yesterday. Now, sometimes I'm full, more fully recovered on day three. So it's a three day cycle. Sometimes work stress gets in the way, you know, uh, or other life stress gets in the way. I've got to push it to a five day cycle. Or when I was battling COVID, my daughter had COVID in May just to take it easy and not overstress uh, my system to give myself the best ability to recover as quick as possible. I actually push that into seven days, just not trying to overtax the system. So um, knowing what overtrain looks like using heart rate variability and resting heart rate as objective metrics, and then following that to a T, uh, that's what's worked for me. I've done that for five years now. And those data are supposed to get worse with age. Heart rate variability goes down with age. Uh, resting heart rate peaks at about 50 and then goes down. But uh, I've actually, you know, in some ways like Brian Johnson and actually better because uh, he and I have corresponded and I actually recommended to him, you're overtraining because mm -hmm. I shouldn't have better data than him. He's younger than me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually 
you know, not to boast, but but uh, I've pushed my heart rate variability back towards more youthful levels and uh, heart rate uh, pushed resting heart rate down lower, um, which is the way it should be high, high heart rate variability, low resting heart rate. So, mm. yeah, HRV is also yeah, very, very useful. And like, you know, you can even use things like even just, you know, how you feel in terms of balance, like if you have, you know, struggling, maintaining balance with your one leg then uh, that can be a sign of like nervous system being over fried or um, if your like grip strength is weak like if you just have less strength than you usually do and you're trying to like push through it then you know yeah like you cannot get get the workout in but you might not you know adapt to a higher level so like if you're still weaker than the last time then you probably are still under recovering or you have like some other you know hole in your boat so to say that uh, is kind of sinking it so you, you can just into eventually like everyone will develop some intuition about you know whether or not they are recovered or if they're overtraining but uh, yeah like if you get sick for example then uh, that can be a sign that that you're like doing too much for me the intuitive is tricky though because the the mindset involved in regular training you know and especially if you're doing uh strength training uh you know you can't be, and I, <laughs> you can't be weak mentally to strength train because you're challenging yourself mentally right right so for me the intuitive uh, stuff is a very uh, tricky, slippery slope because there may be days I wake up and I say, oh, I don't want to do it. And then if, am I am I doing that because I'm legitimately not fully recovered yet? Am I doing that because I'm being lazy? When I have the objective for me, for other people may be different, but for me, when I have the objective metrics, there's no excuse if I see my most fully recovered uh, heart mm -hmm. rate variability, resting heart rate. Uh, and that's helped tremendously too in terms of uh, you know, the intuition, right? So I don't have to think about it now. I see the data, it's let's go. The data doesn't look great. It's like, all right, I can push it another day. This is clearly not fully recovered. Uh, you know, but then the, even it, it, on a day when the, the CV metrics, the cardiovascular metrics aren't as at my best, are there days when I have to push through it in order to stick to a certain, you know, work schedule, for example? I do that. It's not ideal. But um, yeah, I, I hear you about the intuition. I prefer the more, you know, quantifiable way, but I can I can see it may work for some. Yeah. So what kind of like workouts do you do? Like what is what do you think is the most important kind of exercise to do for the longevity? Yeah. Well, comp so there's a few things. Compound move I stick to the compound movements, uh, you know, uh multi uh joint movements. So pull-ups, push-ups. I don't have, I do it in my apartment. You know, I, it's time efficient and eventually I'll, I'll have a bigger place. I'll have more equipment, but uh, pull-ups, push-ups, deadlifts, overhead press, um, uh, rows, uh, lunges. I stay away from squats because I've, I've had herniated discs in the past from uh, eagle lifting and too heavy squats. So I've got to be very careful with uh, how much I'm doing in terms of loading my spine. Uh, and then a whole bunch of mobility, Calis calisthenics, flexibility. I do some like, uh, it's not all in the, uh, I guess the sagittal plane where it's all just, you know, uh, rigid. I, I do, you know, kind of some Taekwondo, Taekwondo ish kicks, spin kicks. And, you know, which is great for core, for the core. And, uh, but it's, it's a mix of strength training. It's like a long cardio circuit of 80 minutes, continuously moving, um, covering all the bases, mobility, balance, flexibility. And then much like my diet, it's, it's quantified. So, you know, I hear, I hear in the fitness space a lot, like, you know, change it up. Or if it, if it gets stale, change it up. That doesn't work for me. Like I'm a quantified type person where I do an exact amount of sets and reps. Now, granted, I'm trying to improve on those sets and reps over time, but I have benchmarks for each set that I do. For example, overhead press, my first set is 70 pounds, 12 reps, which may not seem like much, but I'm 145 pounds, 66 kilos. It's not bad. Mm. Uh, for my uh, second set, I'm looking at 90 pounds, four reps. So that's the benchmark. If it's below that, and especially over time, I'm losing strength. I don't want to do that. So uh, I, I'm trying to hit at least those benchmarks, just using that as an example. Or for pull-ups, I've been posting pull-up videos on my YouTube channel uh, for four years. I was, you know, 12 pull-ups, full extension, full flexion, not this half, you know, you come, you come halfway. None of that. It's full extension, full flexion. So I know that 12 is my benchmark. I don't want to go below that. Uh, so the goal is to at least hit the benchmarks each workout. And then with the goal clearly of making small but incremental gains over time, at best, at worst, maintaining that. And so far, so good. 
even with the uh, leanness, you know, going from about 12% body fat down to I'm um, somewhere probably in the nine or 8% range. I measured it by DEXA last December. I was about 12%. I'm seven or six or seven pounds leaner since then. I haven't lost any strength, which makes me think probably most of it is muscle mass. Maybe I've lost some lean mass. Who knows? It's something hydrated in my body that I probably lost. No loss of strength at all for those major compound movements. So um, yeah, I, I try to hit the benchmarks with the goal of longevity though, is obviously keeping that as, you know, uh, keeping minimizing any decline that I can at, for as long as possible. That's the goal. Mm. Yeah. And, and it seems like you're focusing mostly on like uh, strength uh, rather than mass, which we uh, covered as well that, you know, muscle mass is associated with reduced mortality. But uh, when you look at it, then strength is, is significantly more compared to the uh, muscle mass and muscle mass is also the issue like yeah if you are becoming too bulky for example or if you if you just have a lot of muscle mass but you also have very high body fat percentage then you know that that actually speeds up the aging because you're just you know eating too many calories and the excess body fat is also not good so yeah like you want to maintain this leaner physique that is strong uh relative to its uh, body weight so you're like you know uh, you have muscle but you're not too high body fat percentage and you're also strong at the same time. So that's kind of the main goal when it comes to like tra resistance training. Yep, hundred percent agree. Uh, for me, whatever mass results as a result of the strength uh, training portion of the workout, whatever mass results as, as a part of that, that's the goal. Now, maybe that's not the best approach because I was about thirty pounds heavier at one point, and I was exactly the type you're talking about: more muscle, but also most more fat. Still relatively lean, probably at most fifteen percent. But the consequence there, and I, you know, it, so long story short is get lean, stay lean. Don't not get lean, get big lean, and then get small lean because the consequence there is, so I've got skin here, you know, and I've got skin on my bicep that now looks like, uh, it, like an 80 year old. And it's, it basically, it's basically like a, like a, like a, like a skin mask, you know, it's just uh, floppy because I used to be bigger, right? And now it's stretched out. So uh, yeah, the goal is still to have as much muscle as I can within the smaller frame uh, as possible. But uh, the drawback is, you know, I've got a little bit of loose skin in, in, if I could go back, if I knew better, I would, I would have uh, get lean, stay lean, not get big, then get, you know, smaller lean. So mm, yeah. How would you like, if you are, let's say in your fifties or something, and you're just starting to take care of your health and uh you are like let's say this kind of standard skinny fat or this uh, with a dad bod or something that you don't have that much muscle you're not that strong but you have body fat so what would you say like how would that kind of a person start like what should be their main focus should they like try to first lose the body fat try to first get strong try to first build muscle or what's their kind of operation yeah i think the first approach is uh stick find something that you can stick to for a long time if your goal is longevity so whatever that looks like in terms of fitness, even if it's just regular walking, if they don't want to strength train, but whatever that phys regular physical activity is something that they could stick to for a long time. The same with the diet, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be the extreme of what I'm doing, you know, uh, basically 1% cheat in terms of calories uh, is junk. You know, it, it doesn't have to be where, where, where that is for me, but what it, wherever, wherever their current approach is, where can they make improvements that they can maintain for a long period of time? I think for the regular average person, I think that's the first place to start. And then if they, you know, just even after doing that from some amount of time, if they want to get deeper and get more specialized and get more focused, then you start to take the next step. All right, does that mean more of this exercise or more vegetables or less of something, you know? So I think taking it very slow with habits you can maintain for a long time, I think that's uh, the focus. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, chances are if they have, if you don't have a lot of background in training, then just doing something will, will already put them on the right track. So if you're like skinny fat, you don't have a lot long training history, then just doing, yeah, like regular calisthenics or doing some push ups and pull ups will already make you lose fat, build muscle and strength at the same time. <laughs> so it's like, you know, yeah. But it's got to be, as you know, consistent, right? It, it's yeah. uh, the mindset of consistency where it can't be, oh, once every two weeks you know, Hey, I did a workout. Now it's two weeks later. Like, what mm. do you really, you know, are you making any gains based off that? Or are you really impacting anything? So, uh, 
trying to figure out what's a consistent approach. You know, is it one workout, two workouts, four workouts per week? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the consistency, yeah, like is the most important thing for longevity, because if you are, even if you're like elite athlete or, uh, you're in high school, you are super fit or something, but now you don't do anything, then it's like, doesn't matter that you were super fit. Like what matters is what you're doing it continuously. Yeah. That's probably the hardest part, whether it's diet, even sleep, you know, like, uh, I make sure, try to make sure I go to sleep at the same time every night, uh, without fail. I mean, sometimes it's just not that easy, you know, and that can throw the whole system off for a couple of days. Or if I'm going to travel to Europe, you know, uh, now I've got for four or five days, I've got the time change, you know, so, uh, and that's the, you know, or travel anywhere, not just Europe, but, uh, yeah, it's not always easier said than done, but yeah, consistency is definitely another skill to add to the diet, exercise, sleep approach. Consistency, right. is another layer. So, yeah, absolutely. So what, what about the diet or, or maybe like we can also briefly cover the cardio. Like, so we talked about VO2 max. So like, how do you do you train cardio for VO2 max or. So I don't specifically target VO2 max yet, but, uh, like I said, it's been in the low 40s, the three times that I did measure. I haven't changed my system much since then. So I'm probably in that same range. Uh, maybe even a little better because, you know, how many liters of oxygen that you can consume is proportional to lean mass or even body weight, VO2 divided by body weight. So since my body weight is 15 pounds lighter than where I was when I had my VO2 max measured, technically my VO2 max may go up, even though my absolute amount of oxygen consumption or maximum ox oxygen consumption hasn't changed. Um, so uh, ah, so VO2 max, right? So basically I do low intensity walking in between the workouts. Now, because my workouts are, you know, 80 minutes and it's, uh, I'm not sitting around, like I don't do a set and then sit five minutes and then do another set. There's none of that. It's continuous moving. And e even with that approach, the circuit based approach, even though my focus is optimizing strength, maximizing strength, uh, by doing a circuit type workout, I may be limiting my maximal strength gains but I'm getting the cardiovascular stimulus of continuously moving. Mm. So, um, but that set now, another reason I don't go specifically into training cardio aside from the low intensity stuff after that 80 minute workout is, uh, it can impair the uh, performance of my 80 minute workouts, which to me are like the core of what I do. Everything revolves around now. I don't want to mess that up at all. Uh, mm. so if, uh, so in, in during weeks where I'm on quote unquote vacation, where I don't have to follow an in-person work schedule, I can either work from home or just, you know, choose my day as I want to. So I'm not exerting energy on things that don't do anything to improve my health. Like just going to the office and in, interacting all day. It's a stressor, like a moderately intense workout. Like imagine if I didn't have that and then I could apply that energy to, to a few minutes of hit on that day and I'd get the 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 physically you know the physical function improvement without you know you know with an actual exercise stimulus whereas the work stress there's no functional improvement it's just stress right so for now that's one reason i'm not able to add more into the approach but eventually with more freedom i'll be able to add a little bit more hit into the workout but even that's a little tricky too because the amount of hit that i'll do after that 80 minute workout knowing that i'm already a little bit overtrained on the day after the workout if I go above a certain amount of hit in terms of duration, that'll delay recovery. And now I'm not on a three or four day, 80 minute workout cycle. Now I'm on the five day. Now I'm, so even though the hit may be improving my VO2 max, now I'm affecting my strength and performance. So mm. there is a fine line between how much of it I can, I can include above just the basic walking in between. But the good news is um, when considering my cardiovascular fitness metrics being relatively youthful, it shows that you don't have to kill yourself with extra cardio outside of these 80 minute workouts. Um, so, uh, which is good news for people who don't want to exercise themselves to death. Right. So, um, you can get maximal benefit for, I guess, minimal, you know, even though still two 80 minute workouts a week is still a pretty decent amount of mm. you know, vigorous exercise. So, yeah, you need, you, you, at least for you, you know, where you're at and you know, whether or not you need to do more or less, and uh yeah like like we said like the four, 40 to 50 is kind of the the one that is low associated with the lowest mortality risk and but there but there are but there are you know i i would like to do a little bit of isolation work you know so i can fill out the meat sacks that have developed on my uh you know right. around my elbows right 
I just, I can't, I physically can't yet uh, just in terms of time commitment, but uh, mm. yeah. Yeah. Of course. What about the diet then? Like, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> debate about like, what's the best diet for longevity. Let's talk about what are, what's worked for you right now. And yeah, what do you think about what are some of the like main principles that is most important when it comes to diet? Yeah. So I'm not a dietary absolutist. I'm not a vegan. I'm not a carnivore. I'm not even a, you know, flexitarian or whatever you would call it. I'm a data-driven guy. Let's see what the biomarkers look like. And then let the diet, I'm diet agnostic. I want the diet to give me the best biomarker profile, covering as many of the organ systems as possible. So with vigorous experimentation since 2015, what that looks like for me is about 18% protein, uh, about 40% uh, net carbs, and about 40-ish, 42% fat, total fat. Now included in that total fat is fiber because fiber is converted by gut bacteria into short chain fatty acids. So technically the fiber fermentation products you can add uh, to uh, fat. So it's it's a basically a 40, 40, 20. Now I haven't settled on those just arbitrarily. I'm not trying to follow a zone diet or whatever that diet closely approximates. That's what the data has driven me towards. Um, it's, uh, I eat fish every day. I eat dairy every day in terms of a small amount of low fat yogurt, not full fat, because for whatever reason in my data, full fat yogurt sends more biomarkers in the wrong direction than right. And while full fat yogurt tastes delicious, it's like ice cream every day. It just doesn't work for my biomarkers. So, uh, I rarely eat beef and eggs and chicken. I'm not adverse to eating them. I would, they just don't give me the, uh, they're not correlated with the again, best biomarker results relative to something like sardines, which I eat every day. And I'm probably going to increase them to test the specific hypothesis. Um, I eat sardines every day, uh, one or two tins, depending on the day, because that's got a net positive correlative score with the multitude of blood biomarkers. So um, in terms of diet absolutism, I've seen pretty good. And what I mean by pretty good is relatively youthful biomarker data for people who are close to uh, carnivore-ish Paul Saladino doesn't have terrible biomarkers for many of them. Some of them can be improved and they look aged. DHEA sulfate, for example, uh, which he rationalizes is within the reference range, but it's not youthful. And mine is in that same boat right now. So that's what I'm trying to actively work on. Uh, But on the other side, I've seen vegans with um, relatively youthful biomarker data. And again, using the metric of not just the reference range, but where should they be for aging or or where, where should they be for youth? and reduced all-cause mortality risk. So it's it depends on the person and um, you know figuring that out for each person, whether it's high fat or lower fat, uh, that too depends on the person. And for people that I work with, I don't, I don't go into it with a specific, all right, this is where we need to go. It's all right, let's see what your data shows after a few tests and follow that, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, of course there's, it comes down to like what the person believes is optimal and, whether or not they believe cholesterol, for example, is harmful or not, or or that I would increase the risk. And of course, it might not increase the risk for some people, uh, and it does for the other people. So, you know, genetics plays a huge role. And, you know, you just, you know, again, like you need to kind of follow the data in a lot of ways and try to uh, get to the, you know, the, refer- the, the results with your blood work that would fit as close to as possible with the lowest mortality risk. That's what, that's what I think. Like you don't know what your genetics really are and you don't know whether or not the, uh, or, you know, you, you can do the genetic test, et cetera, but you don't really know how it's going to express in the end, end result. Like if you do have like some bad genes for, let's say saturated fat or, or uh, sugar, for example, then you don't really know like how it's going to express in the end. So what you can only do is to try to still achieve the most optimal biomarkers based on the reference ranges and, Based on the like, yeah, the the studies that show that what 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 biomarkers and what numbers are found to be with the lowest mortality risk. Hundred percent agree, and that I I couldn't agree more in terms of uh, genetic risk is what can happen, but the objective biomarkers are actually telling you what's happening or what has happened. So mm. that's actually one reason why. And again, I'm not trying to sound pretentious, but one reason why I went uh, into studying basically metabolomics rather than genetics as a postdoc, because metabolomics is basically telling you this is the cellular readout of everything that actually happened or has happened versus the script. This is your genome. This is what can happen. Uh, Now, if there may be stuff that you look at the uh, biomarkers, the circulating biomarkers, and there may be stuff that's resistant to change, and then, okay, you can go back for curiosity even 
uh, and, and, you know, is this because I have a folate uh, SNP that affects methylation status? Okay. All right. So, but even without that information, um, you'd still have to optimize, you know, homocysteine or whatever methylation status uh, uh, biomarker you use, epigenetics. Um, you'd still have to make some changes based on diet, supplements, exercise, whatever it may be. It's almost like the genetics is a curiosity. All right, I may have this. Uh, but yeah, you need the end result in addition to the gen You can't just do genetics. You have to have those circulating biomarkers. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, most people aren't thinking about that yet. Or, mm. You know, so. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, I, I wish you, like everyone would just do some of the main biomarkers on whatever diet they're following and to see if it's something that is actually, or if they are healthy and if they have the, you know, good biomarkers, because, you know, other, if you don't, if you haven't, done the blood work and you're just following a particular diet thinking that it's the best diet you know whether that be a vegan or a carnivore diet but your blood work is really bad <laughs> based on what we know is good or bad then uh it's like you're just taking a gamble it's like just a like very risky gamble and uh you're, you're kind of like deceiving yourself in some ways and uh you know especially you're just following someone else's like narrative if you're following some person's uh, diet if that makes sense yeah, 100% agree. And the same idea can be uh, applied to supplements, right? So just using rapamycin as an example, I, I know of a lot of people who are taking it. And when I push them and say, do you actually have blood biomarker data? Uh, you know, sometimes people will actually come to me too. And they'll say, I wonder what your blood test would look like if you added X, Y, or Z. And, I, and the first thing I say is, which of my biomarkers do you expect to improve as a result of that? And it, so- I think people uh, should be thinking in that mindset. Like if you're taking rapamycin or some other, you know, purported uh, GIRA protector or senolytic, do you see a net improvement in your biomarkers? Have you even looked at it, right? And, but that can be cost prohib prohibitive for many people, whereas just taking rapamycin at a few dollars a month based on hope. But again, like you said, you want it to be a net positive and the only way to know is to test, right? So, um, it, you know, it's kind of like the uh, cell phone, right? Uh, or, you know, a hundred years ago, nobody had a phone even just, the, you know, with the wire. And then it took a hundred years with demand and technology. And then everybody's got a phone in their pocket, right? So eventually the blood testing stuff will become so easily available, whether it's at home or just even going to the clinic or they send a phlebotomist to your house, that prices will come down. It'll become more affordable. More people will want to do it. Uh, and then, you know, people can see or not if, if a given intervention is working. So, um, I try, I try my best to use a targeted approach. You know, I have a specific deficiency and where my diet currently is now is there isn't much wiggle room because it optimizes the net effect of biomarkers. So I, I don't want to blow up the system just to improve one or two things. Um, you know, I want to make small tweaks and if the small tweaks don't work, then, you know, uh, go to supplements. So that's, I, I evolved with no supplements into just a few and with targeted specific hypotheses. Has it worked in a published study? That's a good start. Uh, do I have a mechanistic hypothesis on my own uh, that it could impact it, which maybe nobody's published? I do th stuff like that too, like uh, serine plus vitamin B6, which nobody was talking about. And I'm still doing that experiment on uh, homocysteine. So for me, it's more, a more targeted approach. Whereas I know people like Brian are taking a hundred supplements and uh, you know, it's just insanity. Like what, what happens when you actually may need those supplements at a later date? And you've already built up that endogenous tolerance. And now what are you going to do, right? How are you going to fix a problem if you can't use what's already been, what, what literally, what are you going to do, right? So I prefer to use it at the last when you actually need it and have a demonstrated need rather than just build on everything and who knows, right? Mm. Yeah, like, yeah, that could be true. Like, we don't know that if you build some tolerance to supplements, uh, maybe it's like what you need to wash out, maybe like uh, for a few months or something. But yeah, yeah like I, I don't think anyone has tested <laughs> that idea. Yeah. But uh, do you think like there are, are there like any main like key principles for the diet? So like, you know, are there certain foods that are absolute no, no? Or uh, yeah, like how do you do that? So I think the biggest thing is calorie intake. Now that said, uh, the components of it in terms of macros and micros also very important. But if, even if my calories are above the, you know, where I'm getting a little bit leaner, I, I find that that's the most, you know, potentially toxic for the biomarkers, for heart rate variability, resting heart rate. So, but even within that context, 
you know, knowing that if my protein is protein intake is too high, the biomarkers go in the wrong direction. If my total fat intake is too high, biomarkers go in the wrong direction. But even sat, a fat isn't a, you know, monolith. It's, it's, you know, omega-3, omega-6, mono and polyunsaturated, saturated, right? So what's interesting for me is saturated and monounsaturated, more biomarkers in the wrong direction than right. Whereas omega-3 and omega-6, uh, both of those have positive correlative scores with the biomarkers. So, um, and that took me a while to figure out. So I, I can't say that there's one big thing outside of total calorie intake, but I do see additional uh, uh, value to more specific details. For example, too, niacin, uh, you know, many things have an RDA, which the basics would be to follow the RDA, you, you know, the minimum to prevent disease. But what's the maximum to also impact health and longevity? There's no, there are no published studies on that. So um, many things, uh, micronutrient wise, I'm way above the RDA. Niacin two and a half times, vitamin K, which the RDA is 100 micrograms. I'm currently around 2200, but not not by some predetermined. You know, I'm going to go higher. It's you know, what do the blood biomarker correlations show? If they have overall net correlations, I push lower. Uh, versus my average. The correlations have a positive score. I go higher than my average. And sometimes I'll continually try to push the ones that are positive higher and even higher to see how high can I go. Uh, and conversely, you know, the ones that are net negatives, I go even lower to see how low can I go. So um, I prefer greater specificity, you know. Um, uh, so I, for if it was one thing, total calorie intake, but, you know, it, macros, micros, even foods, how many cheat meals, can negatively impact the whole system, right? For me, it's like one or two days of it. And if I go more than that, now I'm, I'm obsessing about food, uh, I'll increase the risk of an overeat or a binge and that can wreck the system for, you know, until the next blood test. So even discovering how often can I eat quote unquote junk, which if I don't eat junk at all, that too, knowing that sets me up for a potential overeating or a binge. Uh, so um, there, yeah, it, calories, but there are many layers to it, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, there's different diets that, you know, and, you know, like the calories matter for the body composition and the biomarkers a lot. Like, like I think like the, a lot of the, bio, most of the biomarkers will improve if you just restrict some calories and lose some weight. Like with the exception of like maybe like lipids and cholesterol, I think are the ones that are mostly regulated by the fat intake. Even if you're on like a low calorie diet and you're losing weight, your cholesterol could be still like, high or um you know not in the range if you're eating like like either too much saturated fat or trans fats or whatever it is but yeah like even but the, but the other ones like your crp and blood sugar and a lot of things those things are generally moved in a better direction with some uh, calorie restriction and uh, losing some weight yeah the the question too is if your crp is one you know so the reference range says less than one and most people would be comfortable with 0.8 oh i'm less than the reference range but uh just knowing like i've been saying knowing that less as low as possible for crp there's meta-analysis data lowest risk is basically as close to zero as you can get mm. uh, and i have videos on my channel about that so um you know it, i just prefer the greater specificity and you know what's how can i get to that optimum level for as many biomarkers as possible. Yeah. Just, a, just a note too, not just fat for cholesterol levels, uh, probably the most underrated nutrient for keeping your cholesterol levels relatively low is fiber, including soluble fiber. Uh, there are RCTs using uh, not many. One of them in particular uh, used up to 150 grams per day for, for two weeks and reduced uh, total cholesterol by 30% in just two weeks. Right. So, and most people are probably fiber de deficient there at most, if they're lucky eating 20 grams per day and a quote unquote high fiber diet will be 30 grams per day, but this is probably still low, right? So, um, cholesterol is an easy one, uh, my, but it, cholesterol is an easy one, but you know, it's probably the most debated, you know, and mm -hmm. argumentative, uh, one because, you know, it, the all cause mortality data shows two, 220 to 229 is lowest risk for all-cause mortality in very large epidemiological studies. The one I have in mind is like 12 million people. But, and then if you go below 170 at almost every age group, I think outside of like 35 year olds, increased all-cause mortality risk. So what's interesting about that is, uh, so then you've got the 80 year olds who also 
relatively higher cholesterol associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk relative to older people who have lower cholesterol, right? So that would make the argument that lower than about 170 is, even at relatively young ages and old ages, is bad for health, right? So, um, but my total cholesterol levels have been less than 160 for probably 15, 20 years. So am mm -hmm. I putting myself at an increased risk? So uh, anyway, just what's interesting about that is most people don't know that LDL and total cholesterol levels follow an inverted U during aging. So it's low in youth, it peaks at midlife and then declines during aging. So at advanced ages, it makes sense that the 50 year olds who have higher cholesterol levels probably have better health than an 80 year old with low cholesterol levels. Right, so there's some but, sort of age, like the body or the age rate of decline that, that uh, causes the cholesterol levels to drop lower which is which is caused by aging simply kind of yeah caused by aging or poor health yeah. uh yeah that for sure but then how would you know if you are relatively young and you also have relatively low cholesterol levels are you putting yourself at an increased risk based on the all cause mortality data so um so there you know if knowing that ldl and total cholesterol is a part of the youthful phenotype in 20 year olds it's 170 milligrams per deciliter but that's in the context of high albumin, low glucose, high lymphocytes, high HDL, low inflammation. So if your total cholesterol is also within that context at any age, I'd say you're probably okay. But there's no published data that has looked at it like that. The, the total cholesterol all-cause mortality studies will adjust for like, you know, glucose or triglycerides, but they won't adjust for many other biomarkers that are found in youth. So you don't get that story. So that's almost an extrapolation where I'm kind of hoping that that's the case, but I can't see how I'd be wrong where, you know, how someone who's 20 years old with a total cholesterol of 170, how are they going to have an increased mortality risk Yeah, if they're generally healthy and don't have a pre-existing disease, right? I find that hard to believe, right? There's got to be other factors involved. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like the risk of heart disease is the lowest in your twenties as well. Um, you know, maybe not in, maybe if you're in your teens, maybe it's lower, but you know, you're low. You are, you are already at the lowest risk of heart disease in your twenties compared to like eighties, and you know there's probably something else to the story. So I don't think that the low cholesterol itself is harmful or something that is just yeah. Like with aging, the reason why the people who die and they have a lower cholesterol level, then it has to that their cholesterol levels are low because their body is unhealthy and they're already like kind of close to death, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, but it's just that disparity of. You've got someone that's 50 years old, their total cholesterol is 220 to 2, 229 or 220 to 230, you know, optimal based on all cause mortality. Do you want them to be at 170 or do you want to follow the data? Right. So, right. Uh, could, could you get them to 170 and then make sure everything else looks youthful? Within that context, I'm okay with it. But if now you've reduced it to 170 and, you know, uh, generally through exogenous means, whether statins or other lipid lowering drugs, so now it's at 170, but other biomarkers are aged that probably isn't going to be a good mix, right? So mm. there, there's also nuance to it in that in that area. Um, mm. so. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, like all the biomarkers work in conjunction with each other as well in some ways that, you know, as when you're young, then your cholesterol levels might be somewhat lower than in your 50s, but all the other markers are also much more optimal, like the higher albumin or lower glucose or lower hemoglobin A1C. And so, yeah, like you need to just <laughs> look at all, all the things and try to, uh, get all your biomarkers lower than your chronological age is is kind of the main message, I guess. Hundred percent agree. <laughs> For some things, though, easier said than done. You know, uh, yeah, of course. I don't know if you're tracking. I don't know if you're tracking DHEA sulfate. Just uh, I, most people track testosterone, but testosterone is derived from DHEA. So I and DHEA DHEA is actually the most circulating abundant steroid. So I see more value in tracking that as mm. the precursor too. Uh, my levels were youthful, three hundred you know, in youth, uh, 15, well, I don't know youth, but 15 years ago. And now it's like 120 ish, which is aged. And I've done 21 tests looking at correlations and trying to push that higher with no luck. So I don't know if you're tracking it, but if that's one, uh, because androgen levels decline during aging. So mm. and now I'm trying to work my ass off to try to reverse that trend without taking, you know, TRT, you know, which, uh, that's, <laughs> Yeah. Have you really fixed the problem if you're just taking, you know, some Band-Aid of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, so I'm going to fix the problem. What's the root cause? Mm. So Right. Yeah. But I mean, w if you do it naturally, then the natural is the decline is inevitable. <laughs> you can just slow it down to a certain point. I maybe, add not, some... yeah. maybe not. 
because if you know the recipe, if you know the correlations, if you know the broad spectrum, I don't think that the client, so I, just to push back on that, there are biomarkers that are quote unquote resistant to dietary change uh, and intervention like lipoprotein A. That's the narrative that I've heard for years. And I believe that too. I've seen, I've been able to cut that in half at its peak by making dietary change and following the correlation. So I think everything is malleable. It's just a matter of, mm. <laughs> do you get just, do you have enough time? Right. Because right. if it takes you 20 years to opt to figure out the recipe, to figure how to optimize it, you know, maybe that's too late. You don't live long enough to figure out how to optimize your biomarkers. So some of these things are a race against time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So do you think like it's possible to have the DHES of a 20 year old or 30, 30 year old in your seventies or eighties or. Yes. And, and <laughs> if, uh, rather than saying, I think it's true, knowing that my data has been in the one twenties for the past 20 or so tests, if and when I do actually push that in the right direction, even if I get it to 180, 200, knowing that I've had it so low for so many tests, if and or when I get it there, uh, it'll be proof of concept, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some hypotheses that I'm kicking around in my head. And I should say, I, I kind of have inside, insider info into this uh, because, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't want to sound pretentious again, but in my day job as a scientist, I'm currently studying metabolomic data and our data set is centenarians up to 115 years old and their offspring and spouses. So androgens do decline during aging. Um, but the long story short is there's, I don't know if you're familiar with tryptophan and kynurenine, that ratio. Mm. So anyway, that, that ratio declines during aging. That's uh, basically a marker of inflammation and low NAD. Without getting too specific, I see a road where potentially increasing fish oil intake can increase DHEA sulfate based on correlations in that study. And we'll probably publish that data sometime either later this year or early next year. But these are just associations. I'd have to test it uh, by actually doing the experiment. And that's knowing that my fish intake is already, I'm eating it every day, but it may not be enough. Uh, so I think it is possible to increase DHEA sulfate. Um, I don't know. Stay tuned, right? Mm, gotcha. Yeah. What what are some of like let's say like a few key obviously many people don't have the means or curiosity to do like a full blood panel or something like that but what are some of the most like simplest and like most important ones people like everyone should kind of know like a, few, a handful of them. Yeah, uh it all goes back to quality sleep because as I mentioned if your sleep is suboptimal you probably won't won't be at your best physically mentally and if you're not at your best physically and mentally uh you're not going to make long-term progress, you know, or you'd be less likely. And there's even data too, that suboptimal sleep quality can affect overeating or the, uh, the, uh, urge to eat less nutritious foods the day after or days after. So I think it all starts with sleep and optimizing that. Um, man, now what does that look like in terms of, is your eating window three hours before bed? Is it six hours? Is it like Brian? Who's, I think he stops at 11. Mm. I've found that cutting the eating window by about one ish with very little food at about three. So eating the majority of it as close to earlier in the day as possible has dramatically improved my sleep quality and quantity. Um, but that's for me, for some people, maybe they stop that eating window a few hours or four hours, whatever it is, whatever it is before bed. Um, so optimizing sleep, but then again, calorie intake, um, not overeating, staying lean. Uh, these are all parts of the, and you know, that's probably the common denominator between you, me and Brian, even though your Dunedin Pace is, outstanding. I mean, it's as good as it can possibly get. And I bet you could even go a little bit lower than 0.62 um, and maintain it low, you know, not, not, so I'm planning on getting to where you are. It's just a matter of time because I don't, I, you're probably, I don't know, six, six ish percent body fat. What, what's your, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, the lowest, uh, I haven't, I haven't measured the Dexa scan, but um, if I were to guess, then the lowest I usually would be, would be a, like maybe seven or eight, I think, uh, or, I, or my, I might be lower. I, I just like, I lose a lot of fat on all the other parts of my body. So my back and my, you know, arms and everything are very lean, but my abs are kind of the last part where they don't go. So I, do, I still have like maybe seven to eight percent, I think, but uh, on average, I might be like nine, nine percent. So I, I think that's a common denominator with the very low Dunedin pace is leanness, right? Mm. Maybe, maybe muscle mass, having a, a good amount of muscle. See, I don't know. You'd have to, 
to do that experiment, you'd have to have people who are eight to 9% body fat, but then within a range of how much muscle mass, but, uh, because we're all relatively lean, you know, so, and, and, you know, yeah. So leanness is a huge part of the approach and in support of that, uh, Dunedin pace in terms of its comparison against the other gold standard epigenetic clocks, Horvath, Hannum, Grimage, uh, Fino age in the calorie study, which was a two year, uh, calorie restriction trial in people that they uh, ended up achieving about 11% calorie restriction for two years. Dunedin Pace, one of the reasons why it's so uh, important is that was the only uh, test of those epigenetic tests to show it uh, an epigenetic age reduction or slowing over those two, two years, whereas the other five tests didn't show any epigenetic age change over two years, which uh, they predicted you'd see an improvement in biological age just, as, just using blood-based biomarkers. So people on CR are getting leaner over two years. They're not gaining fat. So that may be in terms of quote unquote biohacking done even pace. That may be the golden ticket there. Uh, you know, yeah. the leaner you are, the better data you'll have. So yeah, uh, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep, calories, leanness, regular consistent exercise. Uh, but then, you know, like I said, that for me, that's not specific enough. I want, you know, how can I what's the recipe for titrating as many of these organ system biomarkers as possible to really slow it down. And then even taking it a step further, you know, telomere shortening and you know, metabolites that are in blood and NAD, optimizing NAD, um, you know, so I'm really covering as many bases as possible, not just, you know, cells and proteins, but getting close to the molecular, you know, level telomere length and NAD, uh, you know, as possible. Mm, yeah, right. But like, if, if a person goes to the lab, so like they, they want to know, like, what, what are some of the, not for the biological speed of aging or, or the just the yeah, like just the, they don't want to know the biological age, but to go to the doctor and okay, what are the like five or six or eight kind of markers like glucose or LDL or CRP or something that is like the biggest bang for the buck to for them to know like how are they doing in terms of their health? Yeah, so uh, I always uh, suggest the standard chem panel and uh, complete blood count, which is a relatively cheap blood test. It's like thirty five USD. Um, so that covers multiple organ systems and the basics, right? It covers uh, kidney, liver, immune. Now in the US, CRP is an additional test. So with those two, which is about $80 USD, you can use things like Morgan Levine's, Dr. Morgan Levine's uh, PhenoAge, which includes nine of those biomarkers. And you can get a, it's a pretty good test because just using Horvath's um, epigenetic test is a gold standard because it's chron uh, chronological age correlation is like 0.94 four to nine, six with a score of one being as perfectly linear as you can get. So it's very close. Levine's phenoage was also in that same ballpark. So in terms of uh, predicting uh, chronological age, Levine's test for $35, basically, well, $80 with CRP is as close to as good as it can get for predicting chronological age. And it's been shown to be associated with all cause mortality risk. So for people who don't want to get too extensive with the metabolomics and oral microbiome, all, all the other things that I'm doing right now, just the standard chem panel plus uh, uh, um, CBC would be a good place to start. But then also just using the CBC, that $35 blood test, aging.ai is also free. It includes 19 biomarkers. So I use that regularly. Um, so it's relatively cheap. Now it's correlation with chronological age isn't as good as Levine's test, but as a part of that, it's because Levine's test includes age in her model. Whereas aging.ai doesn't have age in the model. So if obviously if you have age in the model, it's going to, co it's correlation with chronological age, it's going to be easier. So for aging.ai, it's just 19 biomarkers. There's no age in the model. So the core overall correlation is a little bit weaker than Levine's test, but um, you still get a pretty good output in terms of tracking uh, quote unquote biological age outside of the more expensive, you know, Horvath and, and Dunedin Pace. Uh, and I've been tracking both of those two for a few years, trying to keep, you know, my quote unquote biological ages there as low as possible. And I've had pretty good success. Aging.ai, I've been around 30 years now for uh, seven or eight years, average level. So basically keeping it flat, not not getting older with age. And uh, yeah, similarly for Levine's test, I've it was, like I said, it was 12 years younger. Now I'm down to consistently 16 years younger. And the goal is to keep that, you know, at least 16 years younger for as long as physically possible. Mm, gotcha. Yep. Right. So even outside of that too, just to, just to beat that to death a little bit more, 
I try not to focus too heavily on those tests, you know, because some people, you know, will say, you know, oh, that's your biological age score. It's the cutesy measure. And then I'll respond with, yeah, but look at the published studies on correlations and all cause mortality risk, mm. you know, so it's published and it's got some, but there are no RCTs where if you reduce your, your biological age using these tests, you've now extended lifespan by X, right? So the other way I look at this too, is for each of these organ system specific biomarkers, whether it's creatinine for kidney function, you know, bun, uric acid, just using kidney function as an example, you know, how do they change during aging and tracking that over time? So outside of the biological age test metrics, you know, knowing, knowing how the major biomarkers change during aging and tracking that over time and making sure that they're not getting worse. That's another layer to this that I add, but that's, that's, you know, just the basics. Somebody can get it, can get very far. I think on, uh, you know, just the standard blood test at least, you know, four times per year, just to get a represent representation of year to year change and doing that for a very long period of time. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess like once a year is also good enough. Uh, granted that you don't change a lot. If you are changing your diet a lot and your routines a lot, then you, yeah, like would need to do it like multiple times. But you know, if you're the kind of person who just follows the same diet all the time and the same exercise routine around all, all the time, then maybe like once a year for them is kind of good enough for. I, I hear, I hear you on that. Uh, if nothing else changes, but then that still assumes that that one test is representative of the full year data. So I think in the beginning, it's important to test a lot and then you can see, all right, what's my average, you know, so if, say you had six tests year one, six tests year two, all right, my average age year one is 35. My average age year two is 35. Okay. If I take one test the next year, do I get an average age of 35? If that average age is 37, maybe it's not representative. You'd have to test a few more times to see how many tests you need for it actually be, to, to be representative of your full year data. Um, I think, I think you'll be missing parts of the story with one test per year, potentially yeah. missing, one, you know, so yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, this is very, uh, very thorough and very, I think people are going to love it. So cool. is there anything else you want to add in the end uh, that we didn't cover or you think is very important? Of course, there's a lot, obviously, like a ton of details, and uh, yeah. people can check out your YouTube channel for for all the details and stuff like that. But like overarching, like, is there like something that you think absolutely everyone should do for the slowing of speed of aging? Yeah, yeah, I think I think track, you know, test, track, and optimize. I, I you know, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, you know, mm. uh, yeah. And then it's conquer aging or die trying. That's that's the that's the model, right? So, yeah, uh, awesome. Before I ask my last question, where can people find you and your work? Yeah, on YouTube, conquer aging or, or die trying. Uh, that's basically basically my hashtag everywhere: Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm all over the interweb. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll put Thanks the links. For we'll put the links in the description. And my last question is. Uh, What's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Yeah, I wish um, I wish I did all of this earlier. You know, uh, I didn't start seriously until my early 30s. And, you know, maybe for my early 20s, I wish I, I started earlier. And then even then, you know, it's kind of like a tree that doesn't have solid su supports can grow sideways before going, you know, mm. vertical. My 20s were, you know, alcohol and, you know, the college lifestyle and lots of junk food. I mean, I, I, I unfortunately, I have competitive eater DNA where I could just eat 10,000 calories of, you know, some of these YouTubers are eating 10,000 calories or more. I have those genetics where I a whole pizza and then a gallon of ice cream. And I did that for a very long time, you know, into my 30s even. Uh, and uh, I wish... I wish I had developed this mindset sooner where it wasn't just the last eight years or so of pretty strict uh, and dedicated and focused. You know, I wish I'd done it a lot sooner. Um, mm. How much that affected my potential longevity, I don't know. But my th I'm hypothyroid and that started in my mid 20s. And my diet, even in my youth, you know, it was eat whole box of cookies and cakes and then go to the park for three hours and play basketball or baseball or whatever it was. So maybe I burned it off to stay lean, but just that chronic, you know, deficient nutrient status, maybe negatively affected my 
thyroid hormone function. And so I wish I had done all of this sooner, you know, um, and that's kind of one reason I put the YouTube out and uh, just like you, I've got books on the horizon that I'm that I'm planning on on doing and putting all this into a story where people can read and maybe get started earlier on the journey than me. Um, yeah. Along along those lines, uh, have you? So I th you're doing I mean, is YouTube and the books. That's all your full time full time job. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing that for maybe six years or seven years, something like that. So when you first made that transition, uh, difficult scary challenging in terms of paying all the bills worried about that that's the only thing keeping me back mm. from doing it as a full-time thing right um well of course yeah like in the beginning i kind of jumped into it <laughs> so like i um i i had like a um, summer holiday between college and i came back from um uh, what was it, the exchange student in the uk i came back to estonia for the summer and uh, I didn't have like any money left. <laughs> so my option was like go back to the work where I had been working during the summers, which was like a restaurant. Or uh, like I, I started my blog at that time where I was just, you know, in the beginning, I was just doing regular kind of blog posts about intermittent fasting or my own kind of stuff. And uh, I just decided that I'm going to plunge into it. And I did a, like a little bit of freelancing. I wrote some helped like ghostwriting and writing articles and stuff like that on this Fiverr and those uh, websites, so that helped me to make some income. And then I created some some books myself about intermittent fasting and keto at the time, as well as some guides for that. And that enabled me to like get some revenue. And of course, it wasn't much in the beginning, but it was enough to kind of not need to go to another work and finish my college. And uh, after that, at the college, then I started to do this more full time. <laughs> cool but uh yeah it's uh it's, it's kind of you know the best work to work on your health and longevity <laughs> yeah i'm kind of i'm kind of torn because there's cool stuff i'm doing as a scientist that i, I want to keep doing but academia is you know in many in many cases it's if you don't get grant well not if you don't get grant funding if reviewers mm -hmm. don't think your project is interesting you don't get funded you stop being a scientist and i hate that about it it's it can be six months of work on a grant, which potentially can be that I find interesting that would have broad uh, application. But, you know, so so I'm but there's still cool stuff I want to do, cool experiments I want to do. Uh, it's just a matter of that that grant game versus I absolutely love making videos and can do it full time. And like I said, write a book and put all this in a book, maybe even get a book deal instead of self-publishing like I've done in the past, too. But uh, only because the self-publishing versus the standard book deal, I mean, it's more credibility, people, you know what I mean? But mm. uh, maybe you don't get as much revenue from self-publishing, but it's just that I, I'm just worried about that leap in terms of self-sustaining and uh, anyway. So mm. yeah, you've right. done it. So you, you're proof that it can be done, right? So absolutely. Well, it was a uh, really fun talking with you. And uh, yeah, I think it's one of the like, most exciting episodes. I think people will listen and cool. uh, yeah i think they have learned a lot thanks Seem. good yeah. stuff all right it was great let, talking let, to you. same here let's see if i can get to point six two you know that'll that'll be some fun stuff so yeah absolutely i think you know how to get there <laughs> just take some time if if i can get there you've already proved that you can get there i've had six tests and haven't gotten there yet so we don't mm. know if i can get there mm. yeah well my goal is to get below 0 0.6 so like they say that that's the lowest so i'll try to get 0 0.59 <laughs> nice 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 good stuff yeah all right well have a nice day all right ciao see you bye, bye. But do you want to slow down aging and live longer? If yes, then I'm looking for more people who want to reverse their biological clock. If you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details. 